Environmental Quality Commission meeting. So welcome to our guests who are here for a speaker. And the uh, this part of the meeting is being recorded um, so that folks will be able to listen to it later, folks that aren't able to join us now. Um, my name is Terry Schultz and I am the current chair of the Environmental Quality Commission. Um, and we also have Rachel um, Breton on with us. Um, she's another member of the commission and we have a few guests. So as I said, you're more than welcome to stay after the presentation, if you want to hear more about what the EQC does, um, and I'm going to turn it over to to Rich, who's joining us from Metro Blooms, and we'll be speaking about um, rain gardens. I'm really excited for this. Um, well, thank you so much for um, inviting uh, Metro Blooms to be at your um, monthly meeting. I take it it's monthly, right? Yep. And i um, very excited to be here. And I am going to share my screen if I can. Um, I was looking, so can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep. Awesome. So um, I was, you know, checking it out here. Crystal, um, Western, North, Northwest suburb, second ring uh, suburb, um, I would say. Am I right? I guess. Um, we're past Highway 100. So I was looking at the um, watershed maps. And um, the Bassett Creek watershed is right around the, the um, 36th Avenue. <clears throat> and then everything north of 36th is um, part of the uh, Shingle Creek watershed. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, uh, whoops, I was trying to just get a little grounded here and I was checking out your website. You've got some pretty good information on rain gardens, a, a good description here. <coughs> And um, so that's cool. You even got a, a rain garden care video, which is awesome. Um, and some templates um, for some <coughs> rain gardens. So you guys are off to a good start, I'd have to say. Um, you've done some good things. Oh, there's the Shingle Creek watershed. So I'd say that the northern two thirds of Crystal is in Shingle Creek. I bring up watersheds because it's important because um, oftentimes, you know, they provide resources. Um, why don't people, um, you know, put rain gardens in their yards? It's, one of them is just financial resources. So um, sometimes watershed districts provide funding for that. So these are a lot of projects that we've been involved in in the last, since the pandemic, actually. And so it hasn't slowed us down one bit. We've even moved into a new office in South Minneapolis, and it's really exciting um, to be part of um, the community there at 38th Avenue and Cedar. So um, a large part of what we've been up to lately is um, really focusing on environmental justice work um, and um, you know poor communities that have been disinvested in the past. Um, but a huge part of what Metro Blooms has been involved in is um, neighborhood of rain gardens and that. So I've got a slideshow that I am now gonna launch, attempt to launch, um, and we will go from there. <laughs> oh my goodness. Kind of a whirlwind. I have so much information to share with you all and it's like so hard to like dial it in and um, condense it and compress it. <clears throat> but, um, we will do our best. So um, have you guys seen uh, many of these wonderful predators in the landscape? Um, and, and also like fireflies and butterflies and bees, they're on the decline. And uh, it's a big reason why um, I like to do, I do what I do for a lot of reasons, community building, um, relationships, but um, you know, this is a, this is a human health issue really. And um, you know, dragonflies are, are wonderful predators, they eat thousands and thousands of mosquitoes in the summertime. And, um, you know, we want to protect the, um, the habitat that, um, you know, that helps these insects flourish. And so my name is Rich Harrison. I'm a registered landscape architect and co-director of design at Metro Blooms. And um, I am standing in front of one of my favorite trees, the cottonwood, um, and this is uh, up in Champlin. <clears throat> and we um, take care of the landscapes for the city of Champlin with the Conservation Corps. 
Um, so all the big rain gardens and bio infiltration basins there are being taken care of by Metro Blooms. It's really exciting work. Um, just a real quick, uh, if you haven't heard of Metro Blooms, we have a lot of programs that we, um, that we offer and we do educational workshops, which there will be one in the city of Crystal in May. Um, we talk about rain gardens and natural plant, native plantings, um, focusing on trees, shrubs, perennials, ground covers, turf alternatives, and healthy soil. We also do on-site consultations and design for residential, commercial, institutional, um, all, all sizes and scales of properties. Um, community engagement is a big part of what we do. Neighborhood of rain gardens. Um, it's, it's really about um, changing social and cultural norms in the way that we look at our environment. Um, so we also look at commercial corridors and um, the last few years, renters and affordable housing projects. It's been really exciting to, to work with people who rent property and actually co-create spaces. And it's great to partner with um, caretakers and la or landlords um, that are supportive of that effort because we find that people stick around a little longer and it's just a much better, um, healthy place to live in. And then we also do sustainable land care training um, and uh, let's focus on maintenance, vegetative management and inspections and reporting for, um, well, all different scales of stormwater management, best management practices. So, um, Getting into, we, we are offering a new, we, we always update our Resilient Yards workshops every year, and um, it's going to be online again this year, unfortunately. Um, it has been exciting. It's been a new way to communicate. As you all know, here we are in Zoom, um, and we're changing it up again. We're going to offer um, different modules for people to review ahead of time, and then we're going to work with um, then residents one-on-one -on -one um, at a breakout session where they can work with the landscape designer and a master gardener um, for about 20 minutes um, and they can focus on projects that they might. And I did highlight here um, the City of Crystal's uh, uh, Rain Garden Resilient Yard Workshop is going to be May 19th. So just uh, four days before my big half century birthday. So that'll be exciting to be with you all then on that Thursday. Um, so I want to touch really, really quickly on the conservation challenges. There's a lot of um, reasons why we do what we do. Um, you know, one of the big things is just simply there's just very, very little natural native habitat left. And it's because of, you know, uh, agriculture um, throughout the state and um, monoculture plantings and monoculture could also be thought of as lawns and um, subdivisions and housing complexes and um, strip malls and urbanization, all the concrete and steel. And there's very, very little um, native habitat left. 1% um, or 1.5% one of the prairie um, out west is gone. And that's pretty well reflected throughout the state, through all the different biomes that we have in the northern boreal forest. Well, there's more forest up north, but um, the big woods and um, the oak savannas and the wetlands and prairie has just been completely altered um, since European man has come um, before 1900. So we're very aware of that. Uh, turf grass is out of control. We all have a big love affair with our lawns and um, it uses a lot of water, a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, fertilizer, um, pesticides, um, fuel, single or uh, dual cycle engines, very um, polluting. And then of course, salt. Salt is a big, big issue. Um, it's becoming more of a problem. So if you all, um, have an opportunity to talk to local businesses and encourage them to take smart salting classes at the MPCA. Um, that's a really good thing to do. So they learn that, you know, one teaspoon of salt permanently contaminates five gallons of water. It's permanent. And the only way that it, it gets re reduced is through dilution um, during rain events. And so by the time I um, retire and uh, <laughs> 30 years or who and I'm going to be working till I'm gone. So um, some of the lakes that we have in, in the urban area are not going to be able to support life 
anymore. We are reaching, we're going to reach the threshold of um, salt sailing conditions and they will not be able to support life. So it's a real big issue, but we got to weigh, weigh the consequences of safety. <clears throat> okay. So um, more intense rainfall, more heat waves, um, you know, uh, heat, the heat island effect is a massive problem in areas that don't have so many trees. And so um, that's health, major health implications with stroke, um, heat stroke and, um, and death. And then uh, of course our more intense rainfalls and um, all the stormwater runoff that goes directly in most cases to our receiving water bodies. So over 50% of the Minnesota water bodies um, are in, considered impaired by, impaired by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, either biologically with E. coli um, and different bacteria, um, chlorides, which I mentioned, and then pollutants like, um, or nutrients like phosphorus. And, and phosphorus is the big one. Um, and, um, you know, creating these massive algae blooms, which then decomposes, takes the water or the oxygen out of the water. And then again, aquatic life can't survive. So um, lots of reasons to do what we're doing. Um, also our bees and butterflies and insects are in decline and birds eat insects. And so, boy, you know, world's in trouble and uh, we're, we're trying to solve the problems. So when I come to um, workshops and talk with people, you know, I, I I, you know, let them know of these things. And then we, you know, we talk about, um, you know, imagine, you know, your yard and how much turf grass do you have and where are there impervious surfaces? Um, do you find yourself using, you know, pesticides or salts and just really get people thinking about this stuff um, when, when we move forward. Um, so um, the first step is just doing a site assessment of a property and understanding the hydrology where stormwater comes from. Where is it going, and um, and what is in that water when it's running off? I always tell people put on your galoshes and your rain jacket and go out in a big rain event and take a look and see where water is getting away from your property, and um, that is you know we don't want water going into your basement and you don't want to go into your neighbor's basement. You want to protect your property, but. Um, so much runoff is happening um, going into the street and into, into the storm sewer. And so if we can capture that stormwater as close to the source as possible um, safely, um, then we're doing a lot of good. So that's where rain gardens get in. You also need to take into consideration your existing vegetation, your trees, um, other landscape features like walls and topography um, and uh, other hardscape elements like sidewalks and driveways and your garage and some some in the alleys. We do a lot of work in Minneapolis and now in St. Paul a little bit too. And I don't know, does Crystal have alleys? Do you guys have alleys and sidewalks, boulevards? There might be a little bit of areas, right? So, all right, I see a head nod, Ann. <laughs> so, all right, let's keep on going. I'm just gonna fly through here and we get, in, get into the details of rain gardens. So, um, you know, stormwater management and, and on-site treatment of stormwater, I feel the best way to do it is with another term I'm going to throw out is green infrastructure and um, using vegetation to slow down and filter out that water. And so that's what rain gardens are all about. And also then provides habitat, which accomplishes a lot of our other goals um, in restoring habitat and providing beauty, seasonal beauty in our landscape um, as they bloom. Um, through spring, summer, and fall. So section seven is what we have in, in, our, in our new program, and um, that's focusing on rain gardens. Should I just, I'll just keep on going. I got a lot to, to yep, talk just about. Just keep going and we'll have questions at the end. So all right, I'll do my questions. best. Yeah. And maybe give me, I haven't, I didn't even start my timer, so I don't even know where I'm at. So you've got about 20 minutes left. You started about man, 25. Fantastic. Yeah. Good. So that was all the gloom and doom and, you know, um, thinking about why we do what we do. Some people want to protect their property and, you know, keep their basements dry. Um, some people want um, to have a butterfly garden and they just want more monarchs and more. So more milkweed, um, you know, um, some people like to fish. And so, you know, that is a water quality issue. Um, you know, in rural areas, also wells, you know, a lot of people get their groundwater from wells. We're fortunate. Well, actually, I don't know, Crystal, you guys, do you guys get your water from wells or from the river? 
from the river. Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm in Minneapolis and we have like a state, one of the most amazing state of the art um, water treatment systems, but there's a lot of people that also get their water downstream from us <laughs> from the Mississippi river. And so we can't be selfish. We can't, you know, we got, everyone can make a difference, every single person. Um, and so we got to think about that. This background picture is a project that we did in Bloomington and it is a curb cut rain garden capturing storm water before it goes into the storm sewer. Um, and I know that there are some of these in Crystal. And so that's cool. Um, I'm going to be focusing more on residential scale projects. And we do even larger projects, um, larger commercial green infrastructure and best management practices. But I am focusing on residential here. OK, um, so what is a rain garden? You know. We'll say it's a you know lower perennial plantings built to capture and infiltrate or soak in rainwater while breaking down pollutants and providing habitat. Um, I just say that they're modified perennial beds. And the majority of the rain gardens that I design in residential are like four to six inches deep. So they're very shallow depressions in the landscape. And um, the plants that you would put in them will oftentimes be, you know, 12, 24, 36, even like Joe Pieweed that might get five to six foot tall. And so you wouldn't even know that it's a rain garden. And oftentimes we incorporate them into the overall landscape. So, um, but they are designed to mimic the natural hydrology of the landscape. And I always, you know, what was it like before we built on this landscape? Again, big woods, and prairie transition right around the Twin Cities. So very little runoff was happening. Most of the water was soaking into the ground and feeding the streams and rivers and lakes through groundwater. Very, very cool and very, very clean. Well, now it's the complete opposite. So um, here's a cross section of a rain garden. And um, I'd say the most critical things to understand is the fact that it has a flat bottom. And this is one of the commonly made mistakes when people do them themselves. And it's really important to be the base and bottom to be perfectly flat so that water infiltrates evenly and efficiently. And if it's a little bit lower in one end, and if there's like suspended solids and sediment, um, that'll clog your rain garden and it won't be very efficient and it could actually prevent it from functioning at all in the long run. So, you know, as you all are walking along the streets and sidewalks and in a nice hot summer day and there's a pile of dirt and sand, well, that's that's where there was a pool of water, right? And so the finest of fine sediment, which has pollution in it, is settling out in those areas. Well, if that can settle out evenly and um, as your plants are re-engineering the soil, then you're gonna have a good consistent infiltration happening. I'll get more into that in a sec. Um, you'll also see this three to one side slopes. So think of your breakfast bowl, your cereal bowl, right? And think of those side walls on your cereal bowls being like three horizontal to one vertical. That's the, that's the slope. In engineering terms, you'll see this a lot in commercial landscapes and it's kind of like the mowable, walkable uh, slope, but it also, um, the mulch that you would put on it is less likely to slough off and, and the side slopes will be less likely to erode if you have that three to one side slope. So you don't wanna go any steeper than that. You certainly can go shallower pitch if you if you have the space for it. Um, the other parts there's, you'll see an inlet and an outlet and that is intentional. You wanna, you wanna know where that stormwater is coming from. I'm not gonna get into conveyance or moving water, but you can, you can move water through downspout redirections, through um, swales. The difference between a swale, which is like a county road ditch along a highway, is a swale has slope and it's water's moving along the bottom where the rain garden is flat. Um, and then in some cases you'll see a berm um, on the downhill side, which is a mound of dirt that's compacted. And then there might be a smaller section, like two feet wide, that has some rock. And you'll oftentimes we'll put rock on the inlet and the outlet. And the rock distributes the energy of concentrated flow of water so it doesn't scour any road. And that's why we use rock in those conditions. And big commercial projects, they'll call it riprap, and it's larger chunks of rock. And it's a big pain in the butt to clean, but it's important. Um, 
Other parts in here, of course, the plants, we'll get into double shredded hardwood mulch. That's, we always use double shredded hardwood mulch. Um, and I got a picture of that in the next slide. It's fibrous and it binds together. It doesn't float away. It doesn't wash out very easily. This is also like if you're planting native plantings on a slope, um, your mulch will stay put. And mulch is important because it keeps moisture into the soil. And um, that's important during establishment, plant establishment. It makes it look more attractive in the beginning um, and it prevents erosion. And it also suppresses weeds, which is a, a big, big problem. Weeds are just plants that aren't wanted, unwanted plants. Okay. Um, and then the soil. So I got, let's see here. I think I added, yep, soil health. Um, you always want to keep the ground covered. The worst thing you can have is bare soil. The raindrop is extremely powerful and it'll erode the soil and it'll also compact the soil. And our soil is compacted enough as it is, the way that we've developed the, the suburban and urban landscapes. We scraped all the topsoil off and then regraded it and compacted it and Think about the, the, the snow load that we have during the, this crystallized months, and that compacts the soil. And if all you have is like Kentucky bluegrass and small, shallow rooted plant systems, it's not, it's not loosening up the soil. So that soil is heavily compacted. So we want to keep, um, you want to uncompact the soil. And I guess that's kind of what this 12 to 18 inches is. We will loosen that up will add compost in there. A good rule of thumb is one inch of compost spread evenly across your rain gardens and your native planting areas um, and mixing that in thoroughly. And compost adds nutrients into the, the soil, right? So that these new plants you put in the ground can get as established as quickly as possible. Um, and it also helps retain moisture in that area too. Um, so, so compost is important and I would encourage everyone to do that regardless of their soil types. We'll get into soil types in a second. Um, and then the mulch that I uh, mentioned. Um, yeah, so <laughs> soil types, you know, clay is very heavy soil. It doesn't infiltrate very well. Sandy soil is very loose and it just allows lots and lots of water to go through. But you definitely want to know your soils um, when you're planting a rain garden because you don't want your rain garden to hold water more than 48 hours. We always try to aim for 24 hours. And a good way to test your soil is just to dig a nine inch deep hole, nine inches round, like an old fashioned coffee can, fill it up with water, let that water soak in, fill it up again and put a popsicle stick or a pencil right on the sidewall, right where the top of the water is, and then come back in one hour and measure how far it went down. And then you multiply that number by 24. So if it only went down a quarter of an inch or 0.25 inches, and then you multiply it by 24, um, you know that would be six inches. And that is the magic number that we aim for. The majority of the, the soils in the Twin Cities can handle that unless they're really heavy clay. So again, like, you know, if, you're, if your rain garden is going to be nine inches deep and your soil can only infiltrate six inches in 24 hours, you might have standing water and your plants could rot. And also we do this because the mosquito incubates in 72 hours. So we do not want to create a mosquito breeding ground. Um, so that's, that's another important um, fact to understand. And also when we inspect rain gardens and if they are holding water for more than 48 hours, then you know you got a bit of a problem. Um, if you have heavy clay soils, you can put in under drains with drain tile and rock and then daylight that further down slope um, or tie it into a storm sewer. Um, that is an option. If, but if you don't have that option, then you wanna definitely keep it around three or four inches deep. But I'll, I'll show you a little, um, diagram of some roots in a little while and it's amazing what they do and they increase the infiltration as they um, mature okay um how are we doing 10 minutes maybe um <laughs> thanks thumbs up terry all right um siting your rain garden you want to keep rain gardens at least 10 feet away from a basement and this is with the idea that when water hits the ground or when you've got concentrated water 
it soaks in. This is a, a generalization, but it goes in at a 45 degree angle. So if you got a 10 foot deep basement, you want to keep that concentrated infiltration zone at least 10 feet away. So this is like, it's, I call it the one-to-one -one rule. And if you've got like a garden level, um, you know, four, in, four feet deep, you'll want to stay four feet away. If you've got retaining walls, you definitely want to keep them away from them. So if you have a three, four foot rank retaining wall, at a minimum, stay that same distance away from it. And if it's an old retaining wall, I would never consider putting a rain garden on top of that. The hydrostatic pressure in the soil will just push that and over and it'll make it fail. But if you are building one from scratch and you know that you've got drain tile and drainage rock, sometimes you can pull those off. So talk to a specialist if you have walls. Um, you also want to um, be careful around existing trees. Um, think about the canopy extent of a tree, the drip line. Um, the closer you get to the trunk, the bigger the roots are. So um, the trees are hydrophilic. They love water. Um, most, most of our trees, but, um, you don't want to stress out a tree and cut its roots. And if it's an oak, you really want to be careful because there's a oak wilt disease and you don't want to trim them or, or damage your root systems during the summer months. Okay. Um, and then of course, underground utilities. So you always call 811 or go for state one before you dig, understand where you, where your utilities are. The most commonly, um, Hit utility would be like a private one that goes to a garage or a shed and it's really shallow and it never gets marked. So if you do have those situations, look for that conduit at the house and at that structure or maybe even a external light um, that you might have in your yard. Um, and, and usually it's a straight line, but not always. So you wanna be aware of that. Then you wanna dig very carefully and what we call potholing. And you're just very, very careful in trying to find that so you know where it is. Um, you can put rain gardens on top of gas lines and, um, and of course, um, water and sewer, um, but you definitely don't want to put big trees in those conditions or even shrubs I would probably avoid. Um, knowing if they need to be replaced, then that investment of a, of a, you know, a centurion type tree, you know, you don't want to have to cut that tree down. So, um, but perennials, not a big deal. So you can do that. So okay. it sounds like they need full, and I'm going to interrupt just because. Yep. Um, yep. Please cut me off and start asking do they, questions. Do they need full sun? Does a rain, rain garden do better in full sun? Yeah. So that's a good question. Your light requirements. And the answer is no. Okay. Um, there are a lot of plant material um, that can do very well and even bloom in shade. And um, Gosh, I have a series of slides that shows some plants that you would plant in the top, side slopes, and bottom. Okay. And I, cho I chose our slide series that are in full sun, and I should have done the ones that are in shade. But um, there are a lot of plants to choose from. And one resource that I'm going to tell you all right now is bluethumb.org. And there is a plant finder tool in that on that website. And um, there are a lot of... Um, a lot of plants. Wild geranium is one of my favorites that will, you know, it, it blooms a little better when it gets part shade or part sun. Um, yeah. But um, it's not all hostas. Hostas aren't even native um, here and they provide very little resources. Although uh, sometimes I'll see bumblebees crawling into the throat of a hosta flower, um, but it's, it, it didn't co-evolve with our local insects. So um Okay. Good, good question. Um, lobelia and cardinal flower will work in the shade, though. Yeah, great blue lobelia and cardinal flower, which are both subspecies of each other, and yeah, they're wonderful. Um, and my my blue lobelia spread um, quite a bit, so that was kind of exciting actually, because um, that's a fall bloomer. And the cardinal cardinal flower will peter out on you. Um, if it doesn't reseed sometimes. And so a little gardening trick I learned from Master Gardener is rake gently underneath where your cardinal flower are so that you can get good seed to soil contact. I'm glad that you mentioned the cardinal flower because it's a beautiful one. And it's one of the only ones that we have that's really vibrant red mm -hmm. in the landscape. That's cool. So much to talk about you guys. <laughs> so little time. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, quick sizing. I, I wasn't sure how detailed to get with y'all, you know, um, 
This is a nice, simple little equation. You take the square footage of the area draining, um, like off of a roof or a driveway or a patio. Then you take your depth of a rain garden. And again, 95% of the rain gardens I design in residential areas are six inches deep. So um, if you um, take that equation, then you'll know your square footage that you would need um, to, oh boy, my battery's running low. Um, hopefully we'll get through this. Um, yeah, so um, if you have 450 square feet draining six inch deep, you'll need a 75 square foot rain garden. And that's at the top of the slope. And I didn't get into the, um, the cross section more. So um, the, remember I was talking about the three to one side slopes. So um, if you have a six inch deep rain garden and if you got three to one side slopes, so the depth is gonna be um, at the bottom to the top is gonna be six times three, which is 18 or a foot and a half. So I like to think of the bottom as a minimum of three feet deep, I'm sorry, three feet wide. And then if you've got a foot and a half on both sides of side slopes to the top of that slope, then it's another foot and a half on both sides. So I would say your smallest rain garden is about six feet wide. Okay. You, can, okay. you can get narrower, the absolute narrowest basin bottom again, and it's gotta be perfectly flat. And so you gotta rake it out. So your garden rake is about 12 to 12 to 18 inches wide. So you could get a little bit more narrow, but I always tell people, you know, our wingspan is our height. So think about that. If you're six foot tall, then your wingspan is six feet, give or take a little bit. So it's kind of a good visual to um, get a feel. And then the length of it, you know, then you just divide that by six and then you'll know like it, it could be like six foot by 13 or six foot by 15 or six foot by 20. And of course, you can get wider, wider too, if you have space for it. They don't have to be rectangle. They can be L, they can be kidney bean shaped. They can be all kinds of different shapes. So fit it into the landscape the best you can. I often put them on like the drip line of the tree, which is curved. And that's why you might see like kidney shaped landscape or, or rain gardens, because it's right along that drip line of the tree. For pollinator habitat, uh, there's a whole new trend to, to understand corridors and patches and understanding the corridors that could be created by rain gardens. And we've had like a project in around Lake Nokomis in Hiawatha called Monarch Mile along 50th Street. And it was like putting these little patches in there that connect two massive nature scape areas that have large areas of, um, of pollinator habitat. And so you know, if you think um, how far the smallest insects will fly or, or bees um, to forage, um, some of them don't go very far. So if you can make those connections and provide areas that they can, you know, hop, you know, from garden to garden, that's yeah. one way to think of it. So um, for stormwater wise, um, you know, it's understanding your soils and your proximity to maybe more sensitive areas. Um, that's a big question. I could go on for a while. So is, is the PowerPoint something you can share with Anne that we can distribute to folks who were on here or is it something you don't like to distribute? Yeah, I, I could. I also talk to the folks. I okay. kind of, we're in the process of still developing our um, next version of the workshop. And I pulled some of the slides from them that aren't a hundred percent. But okay. yeah, I, I have some resources. I'll, I'll share something with you guys. Yeah, even if it's just a short list of, of resources, that would be great yeah. that we could, you know, attach to um, the recording as we put it out there for people. And yeah, also so we can publicize the um, May 19th workshop, mm -hmm. which I mean, I'm going to sign up for it. So <laughs> for sure. And we do have a whole resource packet that we give folks that attend that workshop. Okay. And um, part of it is a big document from the Lawns to Legumes program, which is just it's cool. uh, in our blue thumb partners. I'm so, looking forward to yes. that. It's right. really, ex this is a very exciting time, you know, in these dark days of pandemic and zoom and um, <laughs> I'm, I've become a photographer and it brings me great joy taking pictures of flowers and insects and, and all the different life that comes to the yard. Once you start practicing, mm -hmm. you know, these, so thank you so much, everyone, for letting me speak to you more than you probably expected. 
<laughs> well, no, we really appreciate all the knowledge. Thank we you. Are thank happy you that you're here much. to share with us. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay, and reach out if you have more questions. Um, you have. I will. Email. Don't worry. Thanks, okay. Rich. Thank yeah. you very much. All right, you guys have a good meeting. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Thank stay you. warm. Bye. Yep. You too. Bye. Bye.